Wednesday. Had it been any later in the day, this seemed to not have been possible. The sound of birds stripping and the occasional ripple in the water was one of the only miracles left in the world, in the mind of Michael Conway. Too early for the rush of morning commuters to disturb the peacefulness in the small part that he had come to love. Michael Conlon had always found comfort in isolation, preferring the company of wind rather than voices, as one might imagine he didn't have many friends. That was all right to Michael Conlon, but was certainly something to as most people he had come to know. Michael sat in a low-hanging tree by a small pond over to the more dense side of the park. He wore dark jeans, tan sandals, and a loose white colored shirt stained by grass accompanied by a purple tie. It was six o'clock, and the morning's chaos was soon to begin. He climbed down from his spot in the tree, knelt by the edge of the pond, and looked down. What looked up from the pond was a young face, bold, deep blue eyes with black tender teeth. The face was pale and had long, unkempt black hair. Michael Conlon drew a soft, round stone from within his pocket. He studied it for a minute, running his hands across the smooth edges. For a moment, time stopped in the mind of Michael Conlon, and all there was to see in the world was this smooth, round stone and a glass of still water in the pond in which the face was in. Naturally, time began to flow again. The birds flew away, and angry drivers began to race towards the day's trauma. Michael Conlon stood, still looking at the face in the water, still squeezing the stone in his hand. He then dropped the stone into the water, disturbing the face that stood back. The water was now long glass, and the small ripples could no longer be distinguished from the waves. It was now 6.02, and Michael Conlon began his journey. The miracle had ended. To most residents of Northbrook, he was more of a legend than a person. He was a known introvert and was rarely seen by anyone. He lived in the far corner of the town, where a barricade of dense forests and woods shielded him from the rest of society. In his small cottage, he had few visitors. Those who did visit him did so religiously. You see, Michael Conlon was a psychologist and had come to understand a few individuals to a great depth. Of those individuals, he was particularly fascinated with three: Stephanie Myers, Alejandro, Cicatrice, and John. All three of these individuals appeared to be very different from each other, but in reality, they were quite similar. All of them conflicted with what their lives had made them out to be, and lost as to how they should go about these conflictions. Tuesday. It was around noon when Michael Conlon first opened his eyes. Today, half of the most was just starting for him. After about a half an hour of observing the scene, Michael got up to make some tea. Grudgingly made his way to his electric kettle and switched it on. He then turned on his music player and on came to an MD apocalypse. In one of his favorite pieces, it was another one of his new miracles. Michael was only 28 years old at the time, and to have possessed such an admiration of classical music at such an age was one of the many things that made Michael Conlon a living being. After the tea had steeped, he had finished putting on a white collar shirt and purple tie. Michael Conlon sat down in front of an old canvas with an unfinished image on it. All that was illustrated on the canvas was vertically drawn on the like shit, but it was the wavy lines along the top of his hands. Michael stared at the canvas for almost a minute before bringing his cup of tea to his lips. Familiar with the uncertainty of the process of his just before an the door interrupted him. Michael turned off his music and put on a pair of dark shoes before answering the door. The door. There was no need to verify the identity of his guest, it could have only been one person. Hello, Mr. Conlon. I was wondering if I could come in. Michael nodded. I know I should be in school, but I really needed to get away from today, I suppose. I understand. Johnny was a very smart and very poor young boy in his final year of high school. His home life was complicated, to say the least. Despite that, however, he hoped to go to a good school and to climb out of his family's oppressive cycle of poverty. How can I help? said Michael. Thank you, Mr. Conlon. Unfortunately, there isn't anything you, I, or anyone in the whole damn world can do. Michael sat down in his chair and took another sip of his tea. He knew what this was about. So sorry. Johnny's parents were drunks and always found themselves in a state of turmoil. It was generally Johnny who was caught up in the storm. Your parents? asked Michael. Yeah. They refuse to believe I'll have any luck in life. They think college will fail me before I can fail it. My dad wants me to stay home and help pay the bills. Johnny's confliction was that of dreams, as Michael Conklin described it. He sees his parents as his future if he should stay here in North Carolina. He doesn't want to go to college to get somewhere and so much as he wants to get anywhere else in life. You're almost 18. As long as you get a scholarship, you'll have a chance to get away from days like today, right? I'm not so sure. Part of me wonders if my dad is right. No, what am I saying? I'm not going to let his failures become mine. I'm going to get out of here. 
I agree with you, Tony. However, I wonder if you consider how difficult it is to do what you are trying to do. Getting a scholarship, going to college, and escaping from poverty aren't easy feats. Thinking just like my parents, why should I have to give up on my one shot because you are all afraid? Because you all believe I'll fail. Well, I believe anything is possible as long as I try my hardest. I never say give up. Just be aware that there is some truth to what your parents are saying. It's a rough world out there. Your optimism is inspiring, but it's important you understand that anything is possible, even the possibility of failing. In one moment, Johnny had lost hope, believing for an instant that the entire world was going to be working against him. You know, I've been wondering, what's that a painting of? Michael Conlon again drank from his tea. Staring at the beverage for a long moment, he watched the steam rise into the air. What do you think it is? Questioned Michael Conlon. Well, I guess it could be a boat moving upstream, or perhaps an oddly shaped shooting star. Your guess is as good as mine. Johnny grins, looking down at his knees. So what do you think I should do? I think you're on the right track. You're almost out of high school and your chances are good. You should go back to school now and get that scholarship. Just remember to consider where your parents are coming from. Johnny got up and walked to the door with a new lightness about him. Thanks, Mr. Common. I guess I'll talk to you later.